and it's very nice to see people and to have such a nice uh, welcome from but it is just very very nice to see you and it leads in rather nicely to my uh, theme today which is about bodhisattvas pacheka buddhas and arahats because we we hear about them in stories and i felt it was they were figures that i would like to kind of get a stronger feeling for for their different paths so i thought i would explore this today but as anybody who's been in groups with me over the last 30 or 40 years knows what i say in my books is really just almost like a minute taker i i write down what comes to mind on the basis of our group work in samatha um because we have an approach which I think is quite distinct and unusual, which is to take elements of Buddhist theory that perhaps other people find odd or a bit too mythical or strange, and to say, oh, well, what's actually going on here? Can I relate to this? And I've not encountered this in any group. So I've spent so many years hearing what other people have had to say about suttas and stories and theory that when I write, I, I just feel in contact with that tradition that we have and that we're um, practicing at the moment. Um, it's July the 4th today, so it's the American Day of Independence, and I'm sure the Americans are all asleep at the moment, but uh, I thought I'd just quote something that uh, Pamela Ewell sent me from uh, Alabama. And she's a Samhita meditator, and she'd watched the uh, depiction of the uh, Janaka Jataka on the film that uh, was sent out a, a month or so ago. And she says, it can be a challenge and a pleasure to be deeply moved by artistic expression that is rooted in a culture other than the one in which we grew up. And I think this is very interesting because I think we tend to think, I tend to think I'm a bit disadvantaged because I didn't grow up in a Buddhist culture. But there is something very interesting and exciting about actually encountering Buddhist ideas and theory and stories as a newcomer um, and in a way we can we need to learn from the tradition but perhaps can bring something else to it too so over the last uh, few months i think it's been now 100 days in the uk that we've been in in quarantine and lockdown but for me there's been a real sense both of obviously isolation but also of an immense sense of community and it made me ex want to explore the idea what is it that is the middle way in this that somehow <clears throat> we've always been as human beings we're always separate that's our underlying nature um but at the same time, we're completely interdependent. And most of the time we don't notice it, but I found during lockdown, we call it here, or quarantine, they call it in other countries, that you're actually redefining the grounds on which you relate to people. You're finding new ones. And you're finding new senses of communion as well, and of contact with them, as well as learning about yourself. And I find the middle way here very interesting because it's as if we're finding out something. It's all been an, an emblem of what is the case anyway for us, that we are separate, but we're all completely interdependent. And what's impressed me is how the people, you know, friends in Samata have done so much to use the very fact of interdependency to bring so much for people in the way of... Um, things like this talk and classes. So the model I, I kind of found myself thinking about without realizing it really was, 
it just seemed to pop up was this of this notion of bodhisattvas pacheka buddhas and arahats and i started to reflect on the buddha's life story and i realized well the buddha couldn't have been a buddha without his arahats buddhism began the moment the buddha taught the teaching to Kondanyo, who became an arahat and there was a sangha and a teaching and it struck me that you actually need to have these three what are called lineages of bodhisattva pacheka buddha and arahat for something to thrive for a tradition to thrive and i'm going to start off um with a little bit of history i hope i hope you don't mind it i was a bit nervous about bringing something a bit academically but it's just a little bit of history um in the early days of buddhism there wasn't this division between arahat pacheka buddha and buddha um but you can sort of see seeds of it in the very early canon um in the diga nikaya there are three suttas where the Buddha actually in the first person recollects his past life. One's um, Mahasudasana Sutta, one's the Kutadanta Sutta, and one's the Mahagavinda Sutta. So they're not Jatakas, but actually they are, because they are in effect the Buddha remembering a past life and developing perfections, if you like, which are uh, useful in his uh, career as a, a Buddha. And then the Jataka verses also describe the Buddha working for awakening. Now the Jataka stories were written down and later they probably emerged from this time but there isn't at this time apparently the word Bodhisattva. It doesn't come up yet. Um, I feel there's some impulse that's like a bodhisattva in the, in the text, particularly in the Diga Nikaya, where you have this sense of the universal monarch uh, working for other people. And, but, the, but there isn't actually technically, we don't get the words perfections, which we heard that wonderful talk last week about perfections. They're not mentioned at the very early period except there's one Jataka verse where they are. And it's when Vasantara asks two verses, because Vasantara asks his son and his daughter separately, whether they will collude with him in the Bodhisattva path. Because he, for reasons that are never explained in the story, he gives away everything, his palace, his children, his wife, and because it's a Buddhist story, each one of them has to go of their own free will. It's not a, a compulsory giving away. And of course you can't, it's very mythical and emblematic because of course we don't own our children anyway. We can't either give them away or, or keep them. So it's kind of a very profound story. And he says to his son and his daughter, and he utters the same verse, Come, dear son or daughter, fulfill my perfection, consecrate my heart and do just as I say. Be a steady boat that takes me on the ocean of becoming, for I shall cross to the farthest shore and bring freedom to the world and its gods. So this is a very early verse and quite clearly we have what is later a bodhisattva here. Now, around a couple of centuries after the Buddha's death, um, there were 18 schools of Buddhism. Buddhism just sort of flourished in different ways. And these are, this is the seedbed from which the Mahayana came. And all of these 18 schools had a bodhisattva, bodhisattva notion. So it came very quickly. Now, in the Mahayana, they, if you like, they ran with the notion of the Bodhisattva and said, well, why not everybody? And that's when you get all these turnings of the wheels where you get these incredible, the Huayens, so the Abhatanksika Sutra, 
um, the Lotus Sutra, they took these core notions, if you like, these seed notions, and just ran with them in a certain way. Now, it's sometimes thought that Southern Buddhism didn't have these ideals, but it did. And that's really what I'd just like to say a few words about, because I rather like the way that the Southern Buddhist tradition actually didn't suggest the Bodhisattva for Palm for everybody, but suggested, if you like, the compassion of choice. Which do you prefer? Which do you feel comfortable with? And so from early seeds, we get these three lineages. Arahats, of course, are in the suttas. For Cheka Buddhas, there's one Isigili sutta where they're, they're mentioned really, um, the rhinoceros horn perm. We get the seeds of these three lineages, but Southern Buddhism develops them in, in Jatakas and in mythology and culture in quite a different way as three different choices. I feel those choices have been working in Samatha over the last few months, that some people have been doing things that are very collaborative and these early Arahats must have been collaborative to have come up with the whole of the Sutta Bittaka. Some people have been going and doing things in a solitary way, following their own path. And some people have been doing things which perhaps is part of a larger path. They may have had to be at home looking after somebody who's ill or spending all the time in a hospital or, or perhaps teaching if they, they're teaching. But it's like their path is taking quite a long time scale and perhaps they they're developing one of the perfections, like Kanti. So when I considered that not only were these things going on in Samatha at the moment, but needed to be, these three lineages came into new perspective. Because we, as, as we all know, many uh, of the Mahayana schools feel that the first two are a little inferior. I don't. I feel that while they're the Bodhisattva path is the higher path. I feel the other lineages are important too. So I'd like to, to just give a, an illustration of this. As you can see, I'm in my kitchen. You can see my kitchen behind. This is my only visual aid uh, today. Um, and it seems to me that there are different kinds of cooking styles. The meditator is often compared to a cook, a really, really good cook that knows what people would like to eat. Now, I've been very lucky to have tasted some of the products, as we all have, the products of a tradition where everybody has been handed on a teaching about cooking, which is just extraordinary. And I think this applies to many of the folk or peasant cuisines of the world, Middle Eastern, Chinese, Indian, where you get an, an immense sophistication and richness of food with very, very developed skills. And everybody's trained in them. I can remember going to Sri Lanka years ago and People from the village stayed up all night to cook a meal. Everybody knew what they were doing. They all helped each other. And they were all working within a, a living tradition. They all were part of that tradition. I went to the Golden Temple in Amritsar and they give a meal to 2,000 people every day, completely for free. It's the most extraordinary act of dana. And the food was absolutely wonderful. It, every single dish was beautifully cooked in these big fats because everybody knew what they were doing. And I feel this is a bit like the Arahat path, <clears throat> where people have a tradition that is just extraordinary that they can work in. And if you, if you 
find out about these cuisines. You, used to, you usually find people are quite creative within that. Um, Claudia Rodin commented in, in, in her book on Middle Eastern cooking that whenever she went to, her, this was written 50 years ago, whenever she went to an individual's house, there would always be something very distinctive about their style of cooking. You know, they'd have, oh, I always put a little bit of mint into that. I always do this. But it would be nonetheless that, that cuisine. <clears throat> and this seems to me like the Arahats that have a teaching that, and I think this is a situation where we're in in Summit at the moment. We've been given extraordinary teachings. Um, Lance and Paul and Booman have given us kind of tips to get going. And we're carrying on this extraordinary way of working, if you like. And we couldn't have managed over the last few months without this collaborative work where people work from excellences. You know, some people are really tech based. Some people are good at admin. And I've seen people and, and it, over the last few months who somehow they found their natural metier. <laughs> and this seems to me to be the hallmark of the, the, the feeling of the Arahat path. The Pacheco path has always been one that's intrigued me. Pacheca is, um, yes, and in fact, I wanted to say as regards Arahats, it's the, the, um, the can-do, can-do. <laughs> it, it, that's basically, it means he is worthy, or by word play, you say he's, he can do something. And that seems to me the sense of an Arahat community. Now, the Pacheco is interesting, because this seems to me like the kind of cooking where you get people and they're not it's not common who just teach themselves who don't work within a tradition and who just make mistakes and experiment and produce wonderful food on the basis of that and they need to find their own rhythm their own feel and their own solitary path and the quality of people who do that when it works, and they have to be careful that it works, of course, is that there is something quite magical and idiosyncratic about their cooking. It's, it's, it's kind of very different. And there is about the people who practice this way. I think we all need um, times of, of Pacheca. Pacheca means solitary or... Um, alone, single. I think we all need times of that. It's almost like to contact something in ourselves, which might be a bit idiosyncratic and strange, but that you, unusual maybe, but you just feel it's your fuel. It's, it's, it makes you what you are. I'd like to mention an example here of uh, somebody I felt was in this lineage, though I never asked him. Uh, there used to be somebody who went to the Sale Manchester group called Ralph, Ralph Beresford. And he, for some, somehow or other, I mean, I think this is quite a, it, it's rare for somebody to be completely of this lineage, I feel. He'd somehow or other, he'd just found this way, I think after the war, of just going to, through the jhanas, basically. And he'd basically taught himself, I think he might have been to one or two talks, but he could quite naturally empty his mind and go to an extraordinary state. And he used to go to the sale group meetings and he used to go to talks at the Manchester Centre and the Buddhist Society. And he used to sometimes talk about these experiences and I just didn't understand it. I think about them now, but it's interesting. But I knew they, were, they had some truth in them. And he didn't teach, but everything, every situation he was in was changed by his presence. And my teacher, Lance, commented once after a meeting, which had just turned out in an extraordinary way. He said, oh, I think it was because Ralph was there. He said, things happen around him. <laughs> and that was the quality of Ralph. That, that things just happened around him. He didn't have to do anything. He found some place in himself, uh, quite a private place. 
and was part of the group, but it was like some part of us all knew that that quality of contact was there. In fact, Pacheco Buddhas do teach in Jataka stories, that all the lineages do, but the quality here is of somebody who is what they are. And I think we've all at times felt the need for and been in the presence of people who don't say anything and don't need to. I feel it's a very important lineage and it's very important in Jataka stories because at the time when there is no Buddha, so we can say at the time when there is no awake mind around, to have somebody who doesn't teach, but is able simply to be silent or to teach through perhaps a riddle, can be very, very good indeed. There are some meetings you go to and it's quite clear the word of the Buddha is not necessarily there. But sometimes just having somebody taking, if you like, a Pacheka Buddha stance, just being there, can just change, can change things. Uh, in the Mahajanaka dance drama we saw, um, that story, uh, Janaka, is filled with Pacheka references in symbols, symbology, and in emblems. Uh, it, quite clearly, the Bodhisattva, if he was going Bodhisattva, if he was going to be a Buddha, couldn't become a Pacheka Buddha. But it's as if in that story he's spending a life really exploring that lineage, because in that story everything that's important happens in silence, actually. He's chosen to be king in silence. He finds his wife in silence. He walks away to the Himalayas in silence. And that quality of silence is really very palpable and you can feel it throughout the story. Um, also the, the girl who has the single bangle that doesn't clatter. Or the Fletcher making a, an arrow has to shut one eye. These are single paths, single things. And I would, I would actually suggest that we all need to be able to do this sometimes. And I think quarantine has been very interesting for us to explore the joys of that path, actually, that lineage. And in fact, there's, there's quite a moving little story about um, the Bodhisattva getting told off by a Pacheka Buddha. He, they're two friends, it's the Dari Mukha, and one becomes a king and one becomes an ascetic on the same day. And after several years, the Pacheka Buddha, the, the, the ascetic who's become a Pacheka Buddha, comes back and reminds the king of their old vow to be friends and to practice together and he becomes, the king renounces and takes up meditation. So I think it's, the one who takes a solitary path is still a friend, but in a different way. Still a friend though. And then the third lineage is the Bodhisattva lineage, uh, Bodhisattva lineage. And this to me seems to be like the kind of cooking, if we extend our analogy, of somebody who may come from any of the cuisines in the world but can transcend them because they are so experienced in other kinds of cooking, um, in working with different um, people to cook for, different kinds of people, knows how to cook for a, a large banquet but is really good on beans on toast as well. It's like this comprehensiveness of somebody who transcends the local or the particular. You need the local and the particular, but you also need that sense perhaps over many lives where you're going to, you want to build up experience all around. And it seems to me that cooking of this kind is obviously creative. It's very creative. And 
I feel in, in our meditation, there are times when I think people, I mean, Veronica says, oh, you know, I've been around for a long time. I don't feel I have. And also, you know, there were long periods when I would feel, oh, everybody else seems to be getting somewhere with their practice and I'm not. And I think everybody feels that. And it seems to go on for years or things aren't going well in life or things are difficult. And it can, you need, if you like, a narrative to help you through times like that. You need a story. And we've had wonderful talks by complete chance over the last two weeks um, from Yash on the Perfections and Ingrid on stories themselves. And it's just struck me how the Ten Perfections are a wonderful frame. They provide a wonderful frame for our way of understanding our own experience. So that's generosity, sila, restraint, letting go, the ability to let go and renounce, nikamma, panya, wisdom, virya, vigor, kanti, cheerful forbearance, um, satcha, truthfulness, aditana, resolve, um, metta, and upekka. I hope I haven't left one out. Now, all of these, it's like, you can almost see them as parts of the body, the uh, going right up to, from the base of our generosity and our sila, moving right up to the body to open out in the Brahma Viharas. Um, it seems to me that that's the, the compassion of choice is, is that ability to feel in any situation that there is some lineage there to help and there is some community there to help. That seems to me to be the heart of these three lineages. Um, I think all the different kinds of Buddhism in a way ran with this notion in different ways. I find for me the most fulfilling is the one where we acknowledge with honour all these three lineages and hope that their presence will bless us and be with us. So that's the end of my talk. And I would like to ask Miranda to chant a very short chant. And then we'll just do, I think about 15 minutes practice. Does that sound all right? Imazanin Rajese Mana Kete Samanta Satayo Jana Sata Sahasani Buddha Jala Pari Kete Rakantu Surakantu Imazanin Rajese Mana Kete Samanta Satayo jana sata sahasani dhamma jala parikete rakantu surakantu imazanin rajase manakete samanta satayo jana sata sahasani Pachika Buddha Jala Parikete Rakantu Surakantu Imazanin Rajase Manakete Samanta Satayo Jana Sata Sahasani Sangha Jala Parikete Rakantu Surakantu And return to normal breathing and finish the practice. And if you like, just wish the beings around you 
and further afield. I benefit from the peace practice. Etta wita cha amhe bibi sampatang punya sampatang sabbe dewa namo dantu sabha sampata siddhiya etta wata cha amhe bibi sampatang punya sampatang sabbe satta namo dantu sabha sampata siddhiya etta wata cha amhe bibi sampatang punya sampatang Sabbe Bhuta Namo Dantu Sabha Sampa Tassidiya Sadhu Sadhu I wanted to ask about um, the Pacheka element and whether when you said that someone maybe was so, um, solitary but within the group and maybe silent within the group whether that was because um, what they do was having an effect they weren't saying anything, but what they do is maybe having an effect. Mm, mm. <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean, they're not saying... I, I think, I mean, sometimes people don't say things in meeting because they, they don't feel in the mood. I, I don't want to make a... You know, sometimes you just have people who, who don't say things because you don't say things. But there is a quality of being able to be silent in the middle of a lot of things going on which may actually require a really deep level of um, compassion or equanimity, actually. Um, and if you can do it, just by having somebody in the room who has done that, the whole room has a chance then, in some way. That's how I feel it is. And, and I don't know whether you've been in that sort of situation. Um, I have experienced that at Green Street where... Um, you're doing mm -hmm. activities, but you're not talking, or you're eating mm. and you're talking, but everybody's, everything's just working around you. Um, mm. You're just working around everyone else. And mm. there, is, um, there is a feeling of balance and equanimity there. So I was just thinking mm. of what mm. you're referring to. Mm. It's almost like silence becomes an active thing that helps you rather than, yeah. Is that, is that, did you feel that at the work session that you um, Yeah, it, it's, quite, it's quite hard to renounce in the first instance because you probably haven't seen people for a while and you may have things you want to share. But actually, mm. after a while, it did give you that restful mind state. It was almost a gift from everybody mm. to everybody that you had that restful mind to work within. Mm. Uh, around people mm. and I think there is quite a lot of, of learning in that for yourself mm. um, and, and, and respite from what's going on in the day-to-day -day life and mm. uh, time to just be with with your Buddhist practice mm. 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 And it's like you feel you, you can be happy alone, but you're somehow helped by other people too, isn't it? That you have both of those then, I think, yeah. 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 Yes, it wasn't entirely solitary in that sense. Mm -hmm. It may have been solitary for yourself, but um, but you were working, maybe you're cooking a meal together, maybe you're walking in the same direction outside, maybe you were in a meditation practice but um you're not alone but you your your thoughts can develop if you like you can you're more mm. focused on on your own mind you're able to focus mm. more on your own mind and and i think that was a great it's kind of a gift we gave to each other at the end of it that that we mm. understood mm. that we were freeing each other up from from talking all the time to each other which is usually um, socially what's expected of you um, but but you had that gift to each other of not having to do that and then mm. as the day went on you felt much more at peace and much mm. more to develop your own um, your own practice within that mm. Mm. yes I agree yeah no you said that uh, things happen whatever is needed with regard to Pacheka Buddha Oh, I think they can happen to anybody, but yeah. I'm talking about an observation 
that um, was pointed out to me a long time ago, and I've observed that there are some people who don't say anything at all, but who make things happen around them. And what I mean by that is that you get a really interesting discussion about something going on that touches great depths. And the person sitting there may be saying nothing at all, but it's because everybody there knows and feels the presence of this great still mind. And people used to feel that about Ralph. They could just feel what a still deep mind he had. And it was as if things just used to happen around him. Really interesting discussions used to emerge and he wouldn't say anything, but they just knew he was there. And that's what I was trying to relate to the Pacheka Buddha lineage. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I pro sorry, I didn't explain it so well. That's what I meant. That it, somehow just by being there, he changed everything. Yeah. I, th this is a, a slightly personal question. I, I think you may have explained something to me which I've been puzzling over for many years. Um, I came into Buddhism because I met a man who hardly spoke. His name was Mark, and I know he was a Buddhist. And I know very little else about him. He was actually a martial arts teacher that I met when I was 19 years old. And as I say, he hardly spoke but he had this way of being that fascinated me. And when he told me mm. he was a Buddhist, it stimulated me to learn more about how you achieve this unnatural calm. And he'd only ever say <laughs> five words to me, stop thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that the kind, is that the kind of thing yes. you're talking about? <laughs> Well, he's if he's martial arts, you see, I think although the 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 Mahayana um, sort of says, "Oh, these lineages are so aren't so good," I think it's actually something about the Pacheka Buddha. It's completely. It's, this is not an academic theory. I'd get thrown out of any institution. <laughs> of any. But I think that somehow Pacheka Buddhas are there in the whole notion of the Zen and the Chan lineages because they arose from uh, the Buddha just giving Kashapa a flower and he received, a, and at um, uh, Vulture's Peak, the Buddha just gave Kashapa a flower and he became enlightened at that moment. No words were spoken. It's this, it, this power of silence, I think the Chan and the Zen and the martial arts traditions really understand and, and appreciate. So, I have a, a kind of theory that that strain sort of went underground and resurfaced again in in, uh, in uh, the Chan lineages. And he sounds to me of that type, this Mark. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very helpful to have around people like that. He was. Mm -hmm. um, this might Hi. be a obvious question, but it's something that I'm quite ignorant about. Are they all three seen as end points or could somebody become, say, a Pacheka Buddha and then later become a Bodhisattva or is it a finished point? Mm. Uh, that's a really good question, Deborah. Um, in fact, they are all, if you like, end points, except the Bodhisattva, of course, ends in Buddhahood. Now, Bodhisattva, which I should have said, means the one who is attached to or bound for awakening. It's from the Sanskrit shakta, sakta, bound to or, or attached to. So the bodhisattva is the one that ends up in the end goal of Buddhahood. Yeah, so it is the path rather than the goal, whereas the other two paths are described by their goal. Uh, right, thank you, that's really helpful. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Sarah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, about the Bodhisattva. Um, my, my understanding was, you know, I've not sort of studied that in depth, but my understanding was that the Bodhisattva couldn't take in, you know, enlightenment, nirvana, until all living beings were... were yeah. 
And yeah, that always worried me because I took a no. Bodhisattva vow many yeah. years ago when I started Samatha and I thought, oh God, does that mean I'm stuck? <laughs> well, the first answer to that is that we, things are impermanent and you might change your vow a bit. I don't see, you know, I don't see that's a problem. I don't think we're bound. In, we are Buddhists, remember, we're not bound forever in, in eternal <laughs> But the other thing is, the, the, the way you describe the Bodhisattva vow is a formulation from some of the northern Buddhist traditions of the Mahayana. It was Tibetan, now, it was the, with the Tibetan. Yes, 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 that's right, yeah. Whereas um, the southern Buddhist tradition, and what I wanted to really explain in this talk was that all the traditions have a notion of the Bodhisattva but they just explain it slightly differently. And how it's explained in our tradition is that you take the vow um, and you, I mean, it's in, in the, the introduction to the Jatakas, that, that um, passage where the aspirant Buddha takes a vow and says, I would, I, I'm going to develop the ten perfections so I can help all sentient beings. And his goal is to become a Buddha so he can teach a path to awakening for others. So it's a slightly different goal from the northern traditions or the way it is expressed is. Right. Yeah. But actually these are these are fine points of, you know, I think uh, um these are fine points, and I think one needn't feel that one excludes the other or, or anything like that. Thank you. <laughs> um, more of a comment, really, than a question, I think. Um, but I found that incredibly helpful to think of the three lineages as different ways of working within your own practice as well, which I'd never thought of before. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed what what came to mind when you were talking about the Arahad path was things like when you work in maybe in a discussion group with a group of people. Mm, yeah. Then yeah. the um, the Bodhisattva path has been perhaps more like when you have to. It's something within your own everyday life that's developing the practice mm, in you. Mm, mm, and then mm. the Pacheka Buddha path felt a little bit like sometimes when maybe you've actually done a lot of practice and you just need to allow something to settle and kind of work mm. its way through mm. in some way mm. without doing anything in particular. Um, so mm. I just want to say thank you for that. I thought that was very, mm. very insightful, very helpful. Yes, I think those insights are very helpful um, because I've, I haven't really, I've just been mulling over it and I'd just be very interested if anybody did have any feedback about that or in, you know at some point that's that's very helpful because i think you're right when you come back from a course there's that quality isn't there of, uh, how, finding how to be quiet in the midst of a lot of things going on yeah oh, thank you that's very useful actually yeah. yeah hello yeah i was i just um um i think this is some of it's quite new for me and uh one thing with the bodhisattva i, I kind of relate to what um diana was saying because I like also um, heard someone describing it once, I guess it was from a northern teaching, um, saying the same about um, the Bodhisattva being uh, um, like not able to be enlightened until everything is. But I mean, I took that in a way of, it kind of made me feel quite free thinking that because it's then as if saying um, a Bodhisattva is somebody who realizes that enlightenment is kind of pointless without the rest of the world also gaining similar like enlightenment that and that we're all like connected so therefore i felt less kind of like internal pressure to like i don't know achieve enlightenment and more just to like help other people but maybe mm -hmm. um and it's interesting that that's not how the southern tradition sees it but then in another way it's like a, a, the bodhisattva is I don't know, it's all about working to help people, whether it's, um, you said um, bodhisattvas try to achieve Buddhahood so that they can then enlighten other people. But then the way I guess I've seen it is that bodhisattvas are always trying to enlighten other people as they go along. And I don't know where the becoming a Buddha 
is in there. So yeah, just wondering what you thought of that. <coughs> I think all of the above, you know, you, you, there is a sense that somebody may be following a Bodhisattva path and they have to spend that life looking after an aged um, parent or something or, you know, it's, or it, it could be more that they are actually really very, they could be the prime minister, you know, the kings of Thailand are traditionally, uh, uh, you know, they, they always hope the king of Thailand would be a bodhisattva. But it's, the point is made that you can be doing anything with that underlying motive, really, to help others. As obviously, as long as it's not harmful, but if, if there is something, a job you're doing, which is for the benefit of people or the world, or is just good to do, that can be behind it. And it is the, the lineage particularly associated with teaching, of course. So uh, those that teach might feel a gravitation towards that lineage, but, but it's also there, you can teach in other lineages too. The, the people I've spoken to from Southern Buddhist countries, when I've discussed it with them, they say they feel they're too obligated with the northern vows. It feels too rigid and um, impositional because you, they become enjoinders that everybody should. Whereas they like the more restful sense that you just follow the one that feels right for you. I'm sure there are correctives within all the traditions and none of them should become a bind. They're ways of freeing the mind and ways of seeing any of our experience in a way that helps us and makes us feel more free. None of them should become a bind. You know, they're, they're, I think that's really important, whichever one um, is adopted. Yeah. Hi, it's a little technical question, Sarah, if that's okay. Could you explain the difference from when I use Bodhisattva and Bodhisattva? Oh, Bodhisattva is Pali and Bodhisattva is Sanskrit. And, you and basically all the early schools had either one of those. And the Sanskrit tradition was the one that became Tibetan Buddhism and, and Chinese Buddhism. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Sadu, 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 Sadu,